Shalom everyone, and we are this time in the book of Numbers, Sefer Bamidbar, Parashat Bamidbar, the first parasha, uh, the book of Numbers, chapter 1, verse 1. And here, the whole book is called in English the book of Numbers, which is basically the same name that the ancient Mishnah is using for the book, because the whole book gives you num numbers. Okay, why do we need to count? Why do we need, why does God need to count the Israelites in the desert again and again and again through the whole book? What, what's the purpose of it? So in order to understand that, we have to read the beginning and it says over there in something, in a very special thing. And God spoke to Moses, that's verse 1, in the Midbar Sinai, in the Sinai Desert, Be'or Moed, in the tabernacle, and it was Be'echad l'chodesh ha'sheni b'shana ha'shenit, on the first day of the second month to the second year from the Exodus. Okay, why is it so important? And verse 2, Se'u et rosh kol adat b'nei Yisrael l'mishpechotam, l'veit avotam, b'mispar shemot kol zachar l'gul gelotam. And translation, make it census. But the Hebrew says seu et rosh kol adad bnei israel raise the head of every male in the congregation of israel so we need to understand why through the whole book we need to count and in order to understand that we need to understand the word the verb to count in hebrew it's lispo but lispo the verb is samech peiresh, safar. Safar has few meanings. One is to count, which means one, two, three, four. But there's another meaning, which is the word sefira. Sefira means in Hebrew an illumination. You know, like if you know English, you know there's a, there's a word in English called sapphire. Sapphire is a Hebrew word, sapir, that means a shining stone, which means there is kind of, if, you, if we understand what we are talking about, we're talking about illumination, not numbers, but illumination. And we can make a mistake, and when we go to the numbers, that is dangerous, we'll see. When a person is just counting all the time, he's counting uh, his money, he's got, it's, there's no blessing in that. Counting people, you don't count people, there's no blessing of it. In it. So why are we counting over here? Usually we read this parasha before the holiday of Shavuot. And the holiday of Shavuot follows the counting of the Omer. Counting, or in Hebrew, Sefirat HaOmer. So we can say that the counting of the Omer means, okay, Passover happened a few weeks ago, and there were 49 days between Passover, the Exodus, and Mount Sinai Revelation. So because there were 49 days then, some 33 centuries ago, we count again the Omer, we count 50, uh, 49 days, and on the 50th day, we celebrate Shavuot. And it's a mitzvah to count the days. But if, why should I count the days? I can't just put it in the calendar. And the answer of the great Kabbalist is that on Passover, which was an amazing, powerful night, the Creator gave to the Israelites a, an illumination of such a magnitude that was never, ever received on earth. What was the result? The whole nation was totally stoned. And then when Moses said, guys, Let's get out to the desert and receive the Torah and change the world forever. Everybody left. Everybody moved without a business plan, without catering services, without anything uh, valid on the physical level, but we left. Some people said, oh, we left. We ran away. No, we didn't run away. Some of us came to Moses and said, Moses, why running away from Egypt? We won. We brought Egypt to its knees. Let's take over. First world country. All the infrastructure is here. We'll be the bosses. They'll be our slaves. Let, 
we needed so much light. So that light illuminated the level of the thinking, the consciousness of the Israelites to the level of prophecy. The result, everybody was so stoned, everybody really wanted to change the world forever. And we did. But the point was, the day after the Exodus, the Zohar says, all the light was gone. Why? We didn't do anything for that. What did we do for that? We ate matzah. We ate bitter herbs. We ate roasted the uh, barbecue, the lamb. Yeah, it's tasty, but that's what we did very hard to get the level of prophecy. So that was a taster. We got a taste, it disappeared, and now for 49 days, we were doing this Sefirat Omer. So you can read it as, you know, simply, we counted 49 days. No. The Kabbalists said, we brought the illumination of the Omer. We brought the same illumination that came down to the world on Passover. And one night, we brought every night for 40 day, 49 days, every night another illumination into ourselves. When we got all 49 illuminations, seven times seven sefirot illuminations, we reached the 50th gate, the 50th level, and that gave us what is called the revelation of Mount Sinai that changed the world forever. Why? It was the first time in the history of humanity that people really got the idea that a human being is a free creature, is a free being, and has the right for its own happiness. And that means the right for his body, for his life, for his property. And nobody has the right whatsoever, even you are dignitary, you are royalty, whatever. Nobody has the right to take whatever you have. We are talking how many thousand years? Two thousand, more than 2,000 years before the Magna Carta. And which, this is, the right is heavenly. The ability of a whole nation to perceive the idea that you got the right not from the king, not from somebody else, but you got it from the universe. Because this is a universal rule. That is the point that humanity has changed forever. How? After achieving all of these illuminations, that these sefirot, we received the consciousness that allowed us to transform humanity from that moment and on to a place that the whole of humanity is moving little by little, step by step, into a place of real uh, equality of rights and the basic right to be happy. Why? Because a human being was created in the image of God and he has, because of that, the right to be happy. Not because it's a nice idea, which means if it's a nice idea, somebody can come and say, I have a nicer idea. No, just because it's a, it's a uh, rule, a cosmic universal rule that no one has the right and the power to change because it's not coming from a person's idea but it's coming from the universe. And that was the experience of Mount Sinai. So when we come over here and we understand when it says on, that that was in the Sinai desert, in the uh, tabernacle, we understand that we are talking about the same thing. What is the authority? That you can tell somebody that he has to do this and that. Uh, somebody's idea, somebody's idea, if it's a human idea, uh, the validity is not that much because usually human ideas have, have a uh, hiding motive behind. And we know exactly what's going on. And we spoke about it last week's parasha that when a person is not committed to the eternal rules of the universe, and which is basically you have to give up your selfishness if you really want to connect to the light of God, which is endless. So if you are selfish, you're totally finite. How can you connect and tap into the endless? So you have to commit to transform yourself. However, if you don't want to commit, so you start to invent all kinds of ideologies, 
how everybody else has to change? Or are you going to force everybody to change? And by this, you're going to bring uh, peace on earth and all of this blah, blah, blah nonsense. Why? Because it sounds right if I don't have to do the real job, which is to transform myself. And only, and first of all, myself. So now to apply that, there was a need to go for 40 more years in the desert. Why? Because that idea has to settle down. Because it's not easy for a person to give up his selfishness, his own like imaginary uh, uh, interest, that, you know, our brain says, if I get something, somebody has to lose, right? That's called the consciousness of tree of knowledge, good and evil. And we don't want that. We want the win-win, which is consciousness of the tree of life, only good. How is that connected to the palestra? So here it says, instead of counting everybody, it says, raise the head of all the congregation of the children of Israel. Says the Zohar something amazing. The Zohar starts with the creation of Adam. When Adam was created, chapter 1 in Genesis, he created him in his image. And we learn that verse, but we understood when Adam was created, the Zohar says, When God created Adam, he was he had the form of the upper worlds and the lower worlds all together. And he was included of all, which means if we are talking about that the world is made of structures, more than math, mathematics, structures, fractals, or that's called the tree of life. There are 10 sephirot, 10 illuminations that the world is structured of. Each one is divided to 10 sephirot. Each one of them is divided to 10 sephirot, all the way down that you can see that every aspect of reality is a variable in that great tree of life. And why is it called tree of life? When I learn modern math, math you can see that everything in life, we're talking about the arteries of a human being, the branches of a tree, or maybe the, uh, del the shape of the delta of great rivers, they always get the same shape, which is the tree of life in which things are branching out. And this is how nature is structured because that is the original prototype in the upper worlds. Adam, what he says over there, he in, was inclus, included inside of him all of this, the up, above and below, which means physical and spiritual. Vehava Kremikola, Vehava Nehorei Nahir, and he was shining from Misaife Alma Saife Alma. He was shine, shining from the end of the world to the end of the world. Vehavod Dachlin Kamekola, and everybody was afraid of him, which means. Whatever forces are in the world, Adam was inclusive of everything. Just a second. So how big was Adam? From the one end to the other end of the world. Does that make sense? Does the world have an end? Does the world have an end? Or how tall was Adam? So the middle, she's saying, he was tall up to the sky. Okay? How tall is that? And he was shining, it says. He was shining all over the world. And the middle, she's saying... The legend is saying that just the light that came from his heel, the densest part, the densest part of the body, was stronger than the light of the sun. You understand from that that Adam could not, could have not been a physical being because a physical being has physical uh, size. Something that is tall up to the sky that doesn't, it's not a size. Something that is shining from the end of the world to the other. Is, there's no physical, there's no side, size over here. So who was Adam? Adam included all the souls, the vessels of all that was created in the creation. The vessels, all the vessels of the tree of life, which we call it today souls, all kinds of different of souls. And then it goes on when the sin 
happened, Adam was crushed. And when Adam crushed, there was a big, big negativity that was created. Separation, illusion. And then what does he say? And he said, which means, instead of seeing everything, the whole of the wisdom and the secrets of the universe, you could only use your eyes, your ears, your nose, those physical and taste, which are very, very limited. So we've been confined into a physical world that is the result of the crash that Adam experienced in the Garden of Eden by choosing the tree of knowledge, good and evil. And from that moment on, we're just comparing all the time. Something happens, is it good, is it bad? Is it good for me, is it bad for somebody else? Bad for me, it's good for somebody else? That's a consciousness of the tree of knowledge. And our job, the job of humanity, according to the Kabbalists, is to correct, to fix that that crashed in the sin. So, when you have a big project, huge project, and the government knows that it's almost that it's impossible for one company to take to take that to take responsibility for that project, what do you do? You divide the project to many subcontractors, and that's what the Creator did. He gave each one of us, each human being, part of the project of the correction of Adam's sin. How do I correct that project, that part? When I do my job in transforming darkness into light, bitterness into sweet, confusion into certainty, and hatred into love. All of that, this is the job of every human being. But every human being has another part of the tree of life to walk on. And therefore, when we speak about the book of Numbers, that speaks always about the structure of the Israelite camp. There were three camps, three tribes to the south, three to the, le to the uh, north, three to the east, three to the west. And the Zohar explains, this is because this is corresponding with the four angels. To the south, that's Archangel Michael. To the north, that's Archangel Gabriel. Gabriel. To the east, Archangel Uriel. To the, west, to the west, Archangel Raphael. And that is corresponding to the four elements. To the south, water. To the north, fire. To the east, air. And to the west, earth. So, each one of them is divided to three. Right, left, and center, says the Zohar. So what are we talking about? We are talking about the tree of life. We're talking about the structure of the tree of life. We're talking about the fact that since we all came from the tree of life, the tree of life is called a tree not by mistake, not by coincidence, because the tree of life has that structure of branching out and it has many, many branches, many, many leaves, many, many flowers, and so on, and many, many parts, that, it, that it's not a tree without all of these, part, all these parts. And that's why humanity, the Zohar looks at it as a tree with 70 branches, that is 70 basic divisions of, the human, uh, you, that you, of humanity. Each branch of the 70 is divided to branches, and so on, the division goes on till it comes to each individual. So, Parashat Bamidbar is about when you say, raise the heads of the children of Israel. When is it you raise the head? When you empower a person by saying, you know, you're so important. You're the most important. Why? Because if you do not do your own job, the rest of the tree cannot be fixed. And that's one of the major issues that we have to be focusing on during this parasha. What does it mean? 
We have something, it's, it's very trendy right now, to watch the news and to complain and to bicker and to blame and to hate and to be upset about. And if you are spiritual, what are you gaining from doing that? Only negativity. Only negativity. Why? Because you're not doing your job. What is it like? It's like the old story about this guy that came home and he found a thief in his house. The thief ran away. He was running in the street and he started to scream, catch the thief. So the neighbors came out. They saw the thief running and calling, catch the thief. They asked him, where is the thief? He pointed the other direction. Everybody ran the other direction. So he ran for, for his life. Our evil inclination, the low consciousness that was created after the sin, is always trying to uh, basically camouflage his existence by putting the finger on the wrong culprit, which is, let's blame that guy, and let's blame that process, and let's blame those people, because of because and because and because. And, but the main thing that we understand in Judaism, that when we talk about monotheism, it means that there's an endless light of God, there's nothing but Him, and that light is given unconditionally to each one of us. So every aspect of creation was created to manifest the light of the Creator in a different way because every one of us or every aspect of the creation, even the smallest animals, each one of them represents part of the tree. And if they do not function properly, the tree will never be whole, will never be complete. And that is the secret, the spiritual secret of the world of, of peace. World peace does not mean that everybody think alike. Impossible, because the word in Hebrew for peace is the word shalom. It is coming from the word shalem, a whole. Now, how can I be a whole if, God forbid, my liver doesn't function? Or my left eye? How can I cannot? I have to work on activating each aspect. So, there's no part of reality, of humanity, that is wrong, that is, is existing by a mistake or accident, or it is an enemy of the, of the rest of humanity. You are not allowed to eliminate any part of humanity. The only way to bring shalom is to transform. And how do you start transforming the malfunctioning parts of humanity? You have to start with yourself. Why? When Moses and Aaron counted the people, they did not send professional uh, people who know how to do census. They didn't just uh, take a bid, make a bid for the company that would make the census. They went themselves from one tent to another and counted the people. How did they count? They explained to each person, the commenters are saying, how he is branching from the original Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob lineage. This is the family tree. So, Basically, what the Zohar is saying, which is something that is verse 7 in the Zohar. Since the Torah and the Mishkan is being established, God wanted to count, but now we know count means also to illuminate the armies of the Torah, to make them shine, each one of them. What does it mean? He wanted to know the number. He's God. He knows the numbers. Every given time. He doesn't need to send somebody else to count for him. Come and see. Everything that has to be settled, which means established in its place, so it functions the best way possible, Okay, you need to connect the branch, which is a physical reality, that physical person, that physical uh, tree or animal or whatever being it is, 
you need to connect it to the to the root in the spiritual world that it's connected to. How would that happen? That does not happen. You need to mention it with a with a name. You had to say, to announce, to a point with the words. So basically, it was not counting, but it was making people accountable. It was appointing. You, each one of you, is responsible for a tikkun. And that brings us to something very important. Every morning, in the Hebrew prayer book, there's a verse to be read entering the synagogue. Vani barov chasdecha, avoveitecha. With your chesed, with your loving and, and uh, giving, I'm coming uh, to your holy place. Okay? Eshtachave lechach kuchecha, and I bow down to your shrine. Beiratecha with awe. And the Zohar says that's a code. The beginning, I'm coming with your grace and love, chasdecha, you're connecting to Abraham. Why do you have to connect to Abraham? So the Zohar is saying something very important. Remember that was written some 2,000 years ago. When you want to start your day, you have to go online to connect to the cloud, the cosmic cloud of the consciousness of humanity from the beginning of the creation. It's like, you know, when you turn on your computer, you use the cloud. You use great companies that have huge servers and the program is really sitting on the cloud because your, your device cannot contain such a huge program anymore. So everything is happening in the cloud, on the servers of the provider. Abram, Isaac and Jacob, Abram to the right, chesed, giving. Isaac to the left, receiving, and Jacob to the center, the balance, the central column, they are the three great hubs of, of uh, programming, the three great, uh, great uh, clouds. When you mention it, you connect to it, and then the Zohar says, they, not just that they give you the ability to go online and to communicate and to correct but also they download to you the tikkun, the correction, that the universe is, is needed for that day that only you can make. You just need to take the responsibility and the accountability. That means to raise the heads of the children of Israel. That means not to count, but to make them accountable. Not to count the truth, to understand that you, you are being brought into account and also to illuminate the illumination that each one of us is supposed to bring. If I don't do that, how can I really help somebody else to shine and to correct what he or she must correct for all of us to be in the state that is called Shalom, a whole? So that's the purpose of these parashot. It's all about coming to our own tikkun and to realize that the world would not be a whole unless I make myself a whole, unless I take the responsibility to shine that illumination that the whole world needs from me. That without it, the world won't be complete. Thank you and good luck with that journey. Good success to all of us to support each other and remind ourselves that that's really what the name of the game is about. Thank you so much.